Let me welcome、um, Brittany. 我们唯一这边今天的女士。啊、uh, ，我着重介绍一下 Brittany 哈。Brittany 是啊、uh, ，我 TD 的同事啊，她、uh, 是呃、uh, distribution 呃、uh, PIA distribution 的这个 vice president 在 TDM 啊、uh, TD asset management， 所以她跟亚楠也算是呃、uh, 旧的同事，然后大家都是啊、uh, 行业这个同行，可以有这样的一个交流。那么我们现在就开始我们今天的这个啊、uh, panel discussion。那如果是之后有些问题的话，那也方便可以呃传递上来。那么今天其实呢，在刚才的这个整个过程当中，我们是有过很多的讨论，他们把很多的问题都其实已经呃在这个呃讲演当中能够 cover。那么尽量我们希望就是有些新的这个角度去提到。那 as are like the Uh, as the only lady here, sorry, uh, uh, lady speaking, a、uh, speaker here,、uh, welcome, Brittany.、Um, Thank you. So I would like to have the first question.、Um, so we talk about a lot of alternative investment here in this stage, and then、uh, from and because you work for like、uh, asset management department, so from an asset allocation perspective, can you talk about the importance of alternative investment from your your view? And how that I mean in Canadian market, as the Canadian investor, how they can participate with the alternative investment here? Definitely.、Uh, well, I'll just begin by、uh, maybe even picking back in you know, off a little bit of what Bilal was covering. That at TDS at management, we have a lot of the same views, and so when we talk about alternative investing for clients, oftentimes we are looking for. Something that's maybe uncorrelated to their current stock and bond allocation. So we're talking something that doesn't necessarily、uh, go down as much or up as much, but maybe can act as a differentiator within an asset allocation model. So、um, there are options out there for Canadian investors. Most often, we find that investors will lean into their financial advisor, much like what you do on a day-to-day -day basis, to access this because it it does require some education. It does require so it's not the same、um, as stocks and bonds, which they might already be comfortable with. So they need more guidance. They need more advice on that.、Um, at TD Asset Management, we have a lot of different solutions, and so I can say Canadian investors absolutely have variety of what they can choose from.、Um, I think when we look at alternative investing, you know, a lot of times we think real estate,、um, but on a commercial level, so we prefer when entities like maybe a government agency is a tenant in a commercial space.、Um, so we have pooled opportunities for investors to、uh, access commercial real estate with a diversified kind of. Pooled portfolio within it.、Um, commodities is another area, and that's actually we have a, a commodities fund that there is no competitor. There is no direct way to invest in a commodities forward contract, for example,、um, without going to the commodities markets directly. So we we do advise oftentimes to include asset allocation that is just simply uncorrelated to those typical stocks and bonds that most investors are familiar with. Thank you. I, I think you mentioned about the commodity.、Uh, actually, as a Chinese investor, we like commodity a lot. I think、uh, Vala had mentioned about uh, the um, oil price, the energy supply, and where we are like a little bit panic about recent conflict in the Middle East. And how about gold? So do you think that is something like safer、uh, buffer we should all go for gold, or what is the view? Yeah, thanks, Emily. Great question. So, our view is that、uh, commodities in general are, are especially gold, those commodities which are not generating any、uh, any carry.、Um, gold does not does not provide any、uh, any dividends, for example, or does not generate any income. And in an, in a an high interest rate environment. It essentially becomes a disadvantage to hold gold because there are storage costs. So there is a negative carry for for gold to be to be held in a portfolio. On the other hand, like to your to your previous question on、uh, on alternatives, so we did a study not too long ago 
uh, in Canada, and we looked at uh, the historical returns on on alternative assets such as, uh, uh, as Brittany said, real estate or uh, or other infrastructure assets, and uh, compared it to uh, a typical 60-40 portfolio, i.e., 60% equities, 40% bonds, and we looked at long-term returns, and we realized that. Uh, on a risk-adjusted basis over long-term, investors are better off investing in a typical balanced portfolio of 60% equities, 40% bonds, because like, if, if you look at it in an environment like this, where um, uh, alternative investments, just like any other asset class, because of higher interest rates, they have moved in the same direction, i.e. the South. But having said that, if you look at the equities versus bonds correlation, so many uh, critics of 60-40 of portfolio have, uh, over the past couple of years, have said that uh, because they have moved in tandem, i.e. their correlation has been, has been positive, what's the point of investing in 60-40? In so we emphasize on the fact that, as investor, you should not look at short-term correlation more in more of the studies that I'm talking about where the critiques were referring to, they looked at three months correlation of equities versus bonds. We looked at 36 months correlation between equities and bonds, and in majority of the core cases over the last 50 years, equities and bonds have uh, enjoyed a negative correlation. So over long term, the negative correlation between equities and bonds, or stocks and bonds, i.e. the move in opposite directions, essentially holds. What's the benefit for investor? For investors, if they maintain a balanced portfolio of 60% equities, 40% bonds, if equities go down, the bonds are there as a ballast to the portfolio. It supports the investors during, during bad times in equity markets. And currently, as I was talking um, uh, earlier in my, in my speaking session, with current high yields on bonds, with, with the high coupons that investors can get, it makes even more sense to include bonds. So with high interest rates, alternatives, in our opinion, in Vanguard's opinion, are not a good, um, uh, I would say, asset allocation strategy, especially when you have, with high interest rates, you have lower valuations in equities coming in, so and you have, you're enjoying high coupons. So deploy your capital to... Uh, to that combination. That would be my take, Emily. Back to you. Thank you. So, uh, for when we talk about alternative investment, we know, we know that I think Yanan is also doing some uh, um, PM's role and also now managing the funds for those family office uh, with also institutional investor. So, previously, those alternative investment was only like offered to the in institution investor but now it's open up to the retail investor. I would like to have some view on Yanan. How, from the risk perspective, how do you think that is, are we like, as an individual retail investor, are we like taking more risk? And I will like also hear um, Brittany's view on that. Yeah, thank you, Emily. And, uh, you know, as uh, uh, you just introduced, I used to share <laughs> with the Brittany uh, TD Green family, part of TD Asset Management, managing uh, Canadian pension assets, insurance assets, and endowment. Uh, so I was actually uh, trained as a secondary market portfolio manager after nuclear physics, <laughs> that uh, prior life. Uh, bef you know, now I'm an entrepreneur as well, <laughs> kind of a multi-personality, like Oppenheimer probably. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, so to answer your question, uh, I think uh, pick up the from previous uh, uh, both Battle and the Brittany comment of alternative asset class. I, I, to me, uh, gold is to retail investors uh, could be a, a hedge. You're talking about risk, right? Uh, so I think there are lots of different kinds of risk, credit risk, you know, uh, country risk and also this, uh, you know, geopolitical risk. Uh, I think that's why I think uh, now I would recommend any retail investor adjust uh, investment expectation. You know, be more rational. <laughs> you know, the the QE era is gone. The printing money. You know, helicopter printing money, big bang. Uh, so that's why we have enjoyed such a bull market. You know, both in equities and the bonds. 
before this rate hike uh, for the last 15, 20 years. But now, really, we're living in a radical different time. Uh, so I think uh, adjust the investment expectation. I agree with Barrow. Take a longer term view rather than short term. Because short term, no one can predict. Who knows? Russia invades Ukraine at that time. You know, I have a colleague, because we have office in, in Ukraine, actually, before the war, October. We set up the office and ready to launch a mobile fintech product for Ukraine and expand to East Africa, uh, East Europe. And who knows? If, you know, in February, the next year, the war broke. Even my colleague, my staff, my number one staff from Ukraine, a very beautiful young blonde lady, and she said, no, no way, there's no war. You know, Russia always, uh, you know, just uh, give a warning. No real war. No one wants war. But who knows? Even R Ukraine didn't uh, know that. So I think short term really hard to predict. So I would uh, suggest hedge, hedge. So I think gold is a hedge, 5%, maybe for a retail investor. You know, for extreme, the, the, the end of war scenario, you know, 5%. That's why many sovereign wealth funds already allocate to gold. You see the gold price actually uh, doing very well. So I think the sovereign wealth. Second hedge the risk is the I agree credit risk. So I think uh, I agree high uh, you know you, you know uh, government bonds probably you know with the triple A with a better allocation because the yields going down. Uh, you know eventually with the recession scenario. Se thirdly, I think a value stock. I think for those uh, talking about the cash free cash flow ROEs. I think those are the alphas, and that's why I think uh, you know Tesla, Apple, they still enjoy the dividend, uh, free cash flow, free cash flow, and also high ROE for the future growth. So I think alternative either focus on uh, government bonds with uh, you know a certain allocation or new energy because that's the future for alternative asset class. Yeah. Thank you for the insight. Yeah. What is your uh, how they retail investor control kind of risk when they enter into the alternative? Well, it's funny. Um, I can definitely tell you have a TD background because <laughs> we talk about free cash flow all of the time. And Emily, yeah. I know you've heard me talk about it before as well. So we, we definitely feel when we talk risk-adjusted return, we have a fiduciary responsibility to our investors, right? And so um, we, we take that very seriously first at the, you know, as a simple statement. Um, but what we're doing when we say we want to look for quality companies is we're looking at that, that free cash flow. We're looking at that today. We're looking at that, uh, what the projection shows in the long run. So quality, quality, quality. And so when we talk about alternatives, that, that still holds true. We want quality alternative investments. Um, and so when we look at commodities, and I'm going to go back to that for a second, because the Bloomberg Commodity Index has 24 different commodities within it, right? And so when you look at energy in particular, that makes up roughly 30% of the index. And so energy definitely falls into that alternative space. Gold makes up 16% of that uh, benchmark. And so when we talk alternatives, I think those are the places our minds go first, because that's maybe what we're most familiar with or most comfortable with or maybe can relate to the most. Um, gold, we can at least kind of wrap our head around a bit in theory. And, um, and so when we talk alternative investments, I think, how do we access that? Once again, I think taking a pooled approach, a diversified approach, um, can add a hedge. And we look at what, what are institutional investors doing? We tend to see trends start with institutional investors and, and trickle their way down to retail. Um, alternatives is, is maybe one of those, ESG is another one. And uh, when we look at what institutions do, they are hedging their businesses, whether it's Air Canada hedging their fuel costs. Um, when we look at the Ontario Teachers Pension Plan, for example, pension plans need to last a long time and, and need to be able to spit out income. Um, and so we look at how are institutional investors hedging their investment, and that is through commodities. Um, so now that is available to retail investors, to your point earlier. And again, it oftentimes takes some education or takes some guidance from a financial advisor. So a pooled approach, taking a diversified approach, not just putting you know, all of your maybe alternatives allocation, your 5% or so into energy, because that's what you know, or into gold, because that's what you can maybe wrap your head around. Um, there's ways to diversify even further, because again, as we're all in agreement, it's hard to predict the short term 
whether that's predicting what a rate's going to do, what um, is the stock market going to do. It's easier to say over a longer term time horizon that trends do become a bit more predictable. They do tend to repeat themselves. And um, from an alternative standpoint, if by adding commodities to your asset mix, you are able to kind of push out that efficient frontier. So I'll wrap it up with that risk-adjusted return comment, right? Um, quality, quality, quality. And uh, when you look at your allocation, it's about diversification. And if we really are headed towards a recession, which I think many people in the room would, would likely agree with, um, including our best thinkers in uh, TD Asset Management and uh, our analysts, um, taking a diversified approach and, and really looking at that longer term time horizon is what's going to get us all through um, and fare better during the time of volatility. Okay, let me ask a uh, like bonus question. Just give me a name of each of you, one alternative investment you had your, with your own portfolio. Okay, let's start with Brittany. Um, just one. <laughs> yeah, just, okay, well, that's hard. But I'll, I'll narrow it down to our commodities pool. So it's the TD alternative commodities pool. I mentioned 24 different commodities, uh, tracks the uh, Bloomberg Commodity Index, and has an active tilt in there. So long, short, um, and an active management behind it. How about you? Good question again, uh, Emily. So uh, for my long-term portfolio, my retirement portfolio, I do not invest into, into alternatives. I don't invest into commodities because uh, the views that, um, that I, um, I just shared with, with everyone. Um, for, but I do maintain a, a very small tactical uh, portfolio and uh, because of my, my background in, in derivatives and, uh, and structured products. So uh, basically, uh, time to time, opportunistically, look at energy markets and, and take positions if, uh, if and when it's, uh, it's important. But so yeah, I mean, tactically, that's I understand it's, it's not uh, aligned with uh, what I was just saying in terms of uh, Vanguard philosophy, but since you asked about my personal portfolio, mm -hmm. yeah, that, yeah, that's a very small tactical positioning. Thank you for sharing. Dan? Yeah, so I wear two hats. <laughs> so <laughs> one is a second market portfolio manager and the other is uh, entrepreneur in uh, emerging markets. So I will give two recommendations uh, because I used to be a quantitative trader. So for I think uh, I agree with uh, Brittany commodity is definitely uh, one investment area. But for me, to, because of my quantitative background, I will invest in uh, quantitative CTA, uh, which is a commodity strategy for quantitative capturing the volatility, uh, not betting on the direction. Because directional bet is uh, really hard to bet, and the volatility is very high. But given such a you know, different geopolitical and high inflation recession scenario, volatility in the commodity market will persist. And so that's become a good opportunity for quantitative strategy to arbitrage and do, uh, do, do uh, CTA strategy. So that's number one. For, for primary markets, for PE funds, I would recommend, in, because my background, because invest in fintech in emerging markets, uh, because technology has a big use case in Asia and in uh, Africa, Latin, and that also, I agree with Brittany, because that will bring the cash flow, free cash flow. That's a TD spirit. Uh, so even for primary PE funds, I think invest in those uh, uh, companies that can produce uh, positive pre cash flow for long term. So I think fintech and emerging market, because it's such a young demographic, has a big use case, and that will produce high uh, uh, cash flow for long term. Yeah. So those two recommendations. <laughs> Thank you. I think uh, we take any notes there. <laughs> Okay, so we know that three of you actually had covered in the past of your professional experience, had covered a lot of different area countries working there. Um, so Yanan, when you share your big picture in Asia Pacific, you mentioned about in India and also Indonesia there. So forget about Asia Pacific, we are in Canada, okay? We are Canadian Chinese, then we are in Canada. So let me know if there are any success you could replicate in Canada market or North America. If yes, what is it? If not, why? Yeah, oh, that's a tough question. <laughs> so I don't want to offend my Canadian fellows, <laughs> still Canadian citizen. And uh, no, I think, uh, you know, Canada is big on technology, you know, 
well, in the Waterloo region. <laughs> Waterloo is a big and large. And China has, uh, Canada has a lot of uh, great uh, uh, technology, uh, you know, entrepreneur. Uh, don't mention Zhao Changpeng, right? CZ, <laughs> CZ. <laughs> we won't mention him, but uh, we we'll mentioned the, uh, you know, the Wei Sheng, huh? Big V, for the Yitai Fang Istium. Yeah. So, so I think Canada is great on technology. So why not? capture the dividend, you know. So that's why I come to Canada, always advocate, uh, open our eyes uh, beyond North America, use the technology well in the bigger, bigger em emerging markets. You know, for surfing, for us, we cover 10 countries so far. We do provide digital financial inclusion. The population in those 10 countries already double Chinese population, you know, 2.5 billion. Of course, India is already 1.4. So, so I think uh, beyond North America, technology has a big application. So I think uh, for me personally, I think Web3 and uh, you know, blockchain, those technology are very, quick, are very hot and actually Canada enjoy advantage uh, for, you know, for, for that. Uh, OpenAI is another case, you know, it's actually University of Toronto, our, our professor has this AI technology. You know, Canadians are smart, right? <laughs> so we, uh, we should uh, not look down on Canadian opportunities, but Use the technology, go beyond, you know, go to the emerging market. That's, uh, that's always my, you see I have a passion about emerging market because I think that's the high beta and the long beta for long term. But uh, this, in the future, it's all about technology, how to produ uh, enhance productivity. And that's where Canada can contribute. You know. Thank you, Yanan. That's the really fair comment. Okay, um, Brittany, given your experience like for the last 14 years in U.S., and Canada, you are like the best person to speak on North America. So can you tell the difference of in like financial finance behaviors in these two markets about the invest, investor and what do they like to invest in? What, why cause these kind of different? Yeah, it's, I love this question actually um, because there are so many similarities between Canada and US, for example. Um, but there are still some differences. And so what I found, in my experience anyway, is that Canadians tend to have a little bit of like home bias. So when we talk about asset allocation, we talk about the, the geography and the breakdown of you know, where opportunities are in the markets. Um, I think Canada does tend to favor Canadian companies. And so I, I echo that where it's, you know, we, we have to look outside of just the, the four borders of Canada in particular. Um, and I think there is still a lot of opportunity within North America. You have a lot of uh, diverse sectors and market caps to invest in within North America. And so uh, what I find is that there's, there's more diversification by expanding outside of Canada. And so, you know, when you talk about large cap companies in Canada, that tends to mean the, the big banks. Um, when you talk about large cap companies in the U.S., I mean, you can you can find mega caps and large caps across lots of different sectors. And so as far as um, similarities and differences, I'd say really investors should be looking at what is their diversification. Again, especially going into some volatile times, recessionary times, um, we want diversification. And so broadening outside of just Canada and um, really being open to different market caps within North America can offer a lot of opportunity for investors. Thank you, Bernie, for the share. So, with European or UK for a while, right? So, do you compare these two markets? How does advantage or disadvantage for the Canadian investor in a global uh, proposition of their investment? <laughs> Again, good question, um, uh, Emily. So, like um, as Brittany was referring to, um, like Canadians have a have a strong home bias, and um, we actually recently studied uh, the home bias uh, across equities, uh, and we are right now as we speak um, uh, working on on a research paper for for fixed income. So, we realized that the Canadians. Um, uh, like although their their home biases are like about 52 percent, just over 52 percent, compared to the market cap, uh, on average they allocate about 52 percent to Canadian equities, whereas the most uh, optimal weight 
to uh, to the portfolio where the volatility uh, essentially is at the lowest level um, uh, across uh, Canadian and non-Canadian equities is at 30 percent. And so our view is that that's the optimal. Now, comparison to to the Europe in Europe as well, there there is home bias embedded, but at the same time, the advantage of, of Europe is like it's a very uh, a, a lot bigger market. It's it's a lot more diversified. Again, um, as uh, Bjorn was saying, like technology is 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 the is the key. Uh, factor for for the future. Um, so we also discussed that in our ideas multiplier paper uh, published not too long ago. So with all of that, like Europeans enjoy the, the benefit of being being at the forefront as well. Not as much as as, as the as the U.S., but they have also a strong technolo uh, technology sector. So investors get advantage of that. Um, but again, there are like home biases even within the European Union. So although UK is not is not part of EU anymore, but even when it was, we saw a strong home bias within UK versus Europe, and then within Europe, let's say France and Germany, each of the sub markets they have a strong home bias. Um, so this is this is inherent. All major economies in the world they. They do have have this tendency. Investors have that tendency to to prefer their local local markets. So if I draw a parallel between European and and Canadian and and and, and the U.S., uh, I would say that the European markets are uh, are are a lot similar in the sense of like having a home bias. They have similar access to technological advancements, the sectors. Uh, and because of their preference for the local assets, they, they rely on that. But at the same time, they realize that uh, the U.S. Is, is the largest market. They look at ca Canadian market as a diversifier with strong, some uh, strong names in the energy sector, uh, in the commodity sector. So they, they do invest in on the Canadian uh, equities and bonds as well. So that would be my take, Emily. That's great. I mean, we have knowing that our... Uh, standing point and have a global view and a lot of like expertise sharing here. But I want to give a chance to the audience here. Do you have any question you want to ask for the panel? And uh, I think we, we are good to take two questions here. Okay, we again from Equiton, our like title sponsor for the whole three days. Yeah, right. great, great uh, discussion. I I wanted to give a chance to everybody, but no one is raising their hands, right? Um, oh, it's you. Okay. Um, I mean, in the in the name of I don't I don't really have a question. Well, I, it is a question, but in the name of discussing alternatives, right? We Equiton, we are an alternative investment company. We are on the primary market. We are a primary REIT company. Uh, we specialize in uh, Canadian apartments. So consider this also a soft pitch to all three of you, because I know and uh, you, 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 you do allocations, right, um, uh, for f family trusts and, 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 and whatnot. TD, I'm also a TDer. I worked for TD for three years, uh, last uh, position held, I was a retail investment specialist. So I'm very big on free cash flow as well. Um, so uh, Equiton's pri uh, apartment REIT, right? I, I'll give you five points, and, and this is my soft pitch. Uh, Risk-adjusted returns, right? Uh, we, have, we did a study as well uh, between the years of 1988 and 2022. We have the sh uh, sorry, not we, but the private Canadian apartment index, this whole space, not our company, not our fund, but this sector. Uh, it's, uh, it's got highest sharp ratio uh, across all the, all the uh, different asset classes that we compared. So that's, that's one. Two, low correlation, because again, uh, in all the years of financial crisis, economic downturns, this index, this private Canadian apartment index, has never returned negatively uh, since 1984. And um, 
That's because rental market in Canada, we all know it's a necessity. Buying a home may, might not be a nice necessity, but renting one, having a roof, right? That's, that's a necessity. Three, free cash flow. We are in the rental market. So we are, we, uh, the fund, it's 100% it's in Canadian apartments. So it's got your revenue from, uh, from rent, minus all the uh, operating expenses. We are a cash cow. Uh, and we do distributions monthly to investors at a 6 to 7% annual yield. Uh, fourth is uh, this fund is you know, real estate related, right? I, when I was in my banking years, I worked for RBC, TD, and CIBC. Most of my banking years was, uh, were you know, about mutual fund advise, advisory stuff, right? And so I, I think what we do here at Equiton, we are basically just combining the, the good of, the, of both worlds. It is a mutual fund trust, but the underlying assets is a market darling, especially in Canada, especially among our Chinese Canadian community. We all love real estate, right? So we are buying a fund. It's a securitized um, uh, vehicle, but the underlying asset is what we love, real estate. And then finally, what we do, I think, because we are a private company, right? We are, what we do is we are creating alpha. Uh, yeah, Nan Boshi gonna just mentioned alpha and beta. We are creating alpha in a very big beta market. Real estate is, is beta, especially in Canada because there's, the population is growing so fast and our supply, we all know this, it's, uh, it's very short. Um, so that's the beta part. But in some economic downturns, single-family homes, the prices might, not, might be falling, like what we saw in 2022. But our fund returned 15%. And this is because we create alpha in this market. That's not only a soft pitch, it's a, like advertisement. <laughs> yeah. well, yeah. Thank you, Wei. Um, I, I think, yes, I, we had a lot of discussion today on the alternative investment. We have like... Uh, let the old audience open eyes and are uh, exposed to all the different ideas, which is like fantastic. We can have, I give you like, uh, can I have one question to you? Sure. Yeah, um, it's, and it's the ending question to all the panelists here. So heading to 2024, we, we share a lot of insights of the overall investment landscape. Heading to that, you will speak on your, like your start. Right? Uh, I just asked all the panelists to where's their start. So let us just, um, as an investor or as an invest, investment advisor, I will always ask, what do you think the risk associate with that star you mentioned? Or the question to you as well. Oh, sure. Uh, I mean, so when Bilal was, was uh, doing his presentation, I was saying, you know, personal view. I don't think in, a, in a, a, a recessionary environment. So remember we all laughed about, I laughed at the saying cash is king for years because you know, uh, there was a lot of alpha in, in the markets, right? There was a lot of printing, the rates were very low, so all the assets were returning a lot. So people were laughing at cash is king. But I do think with a recession, Impending cash is not, sorry, uh, cash is king again, and cash is not trash anymore. So, for to to answer your question, for 2024, I think the risk is having too much leverage. It doesn't matter what asset class you invest in, um, and it's also the risk is also you know not being diversified enough. So. The, the, the whole reason why we are talking about alternatives is, is hopefully, you know, we can all diversify our portfolio, families, households, portfolio, <coughs> just allocate 1% is diversification, right? So I think in 2024, we need to be focusing on, you know, cash generating or income generating investments and be very diversified. Thank you so much. So we're coming back to the panel. I, you have named your 
start in your like just now. So what is the, or maybe you give some advice on the risk control side. What is the risk uh, alert or risk management should uh, all the audience be aware of? I think this has been said a, a few times in a few different ways, but I would say the risk is um, missing out on being diversified. And what I mean by that is we need to stay invested even if markets are volatile. Um, we need to stay the course and not let emotions get the better of us. And so the risk of trying to time the market is an, is an issue. You're never going to get, statistically, you're never going to get the perfect bottom to buy and the perfect top to sell. Um, but the name of the game is to buy low and sell high over time. And so taking a truly diversified approach, um, however you define the 60-40 portfolio, um, when it comes to alternatives, there definitely is a sweet spot to help push that we call in the efficient frontier further out um, to gain a better risk-adjusted return um, in your portfolio. So I think the risk is not being invested. I think the risk is not being diversified and completely missing out because you allow your emotions to get the better of you. Great. Thanks, Emily. So uh, I concur with uh, with Brittany. Um, I think it's one of the major risks um, not to be to be invested, to um, essentially staying on the sidelines. One of our research um, again in in 2022 it showed that uh, like there have been like um, nine different uh, market downturns. We we studied those, and 100% of the cases. They were like a very few days when the markets bounced back from that. So the returns are concentrated in in like a few pockets of, of returns that happen and markets jump during during those. So most recent one I remember was uh, due to the COVID-19 related market drawdown. And as soon as Federal Reserve, ECB, Bank of Canada, uh, and other central banks, they cut interest rates we saw a jump in the markets in a matter of days. So as Brittany was saying earlier, no one can, can time the market perfectly. You don't know when markets are at the peak or at trough, so stay the course. That's, our, our, that's been, been our, uh, our message uh, for, for a long time, and we still advise on that. So you cannot time the market. You cannot control the market. You cannot control the geopolitics. As uh, Yanan was saying, like nobody knew Russia is going to invade Ukraine. Um, but what you can control is having a long-term objective, define your, your goals, have a financial plan in place, and uh, make your asset allocation win and use low cost investments. Because as I was saying earlier, investing in, in low cost investments essentially keeps you away from, uh, from losing returns to just cost of investment. And then to, to your question, Emily, on, on risk, uh, again, our, our, we see that in terms of Canadian economy, the biggest risk is, uh, is the, the higher real estate prices the uh, high leverage that Canadian households have amassed over the last few years, also consumer loans. Um, on the US side, uh, which also applies to Canada, uh, is a policy misstep. So a Federal Reserve or the Canadian Central Bank, they essentially keep the interest rates high for too long. That results into a deep recession uh, and long recession. That is our, our major risk scenario. Thank you, Bala. So, Yana, what is your final advice to the audience today? Yeah, so maybe one comment, one uh, com uh, advice. Uh, I think I just one comment on risk with my uh, friend from Akiton. I think risk is a very good uh, uh, alternative fixed income uh, asset class. I come from Singapore, you know, that's why I spend most of the time right now. Uh, Singapore is big on risk. And they actually, the SGX, Singapore Exchange, uh, listed a uh, risk, you know, public market. So my comment is uh, for Equiton without your, your product, I think uh, location, location, 
of course. As I think a focus on probably university areas, the residents, apartment, that's the free cash flow. That's a focus on where the immigrants come, you know, they will stay in Toronto, Vancouver. So I think that's where the cash flow comes from, right? So I think that's the location. Second is uh, see if you could want to get listing as TSX. I don't know about the regulatory environment here. So risk list on TSX can be, uh, you know, diversifiable to portfolio managers and also to retail investors. So that's just my free comment, free advice. <laughs> uh, second uh, about risk, I think uh, risk-wise, uh, I would just point out near-term risk. I think next year, 2024, election risk. You know, US election, Mexico election, Indonesia election, many countries going election. So it, it, will be, it will be chaos, <laughs> I think. Now, who knows, Sleepy John will be back again? I don't know. I was just in the U.S. That's a big topic, right? Every, you know, the, the speaker or they just <laughs> get out, right? Get outside, and maybe Trump will come back. So I say Trump risk, right? So, uh, so, so it's really chaotic right now. I think near term. So I think uh, with uh, peace of in mind, I think so far, uh, I think uh, Bridgewater has a you know all weather portfolio, all weather concept. So I think it did pretty well in the recently. So I think each one sitting in the audience should have an all-weather personal portfolio you know, themselves uh, it's, uh, so that we don't bet on near-term risk, near-term volatility, but hopefully we can go through the cycles, go through the different uh, uh, risk periods. So hopefully it's a diversification, all-weather type concept, uh, you know, alternative diversification as well. So hopefully that will give us a peace of mind despite whoever comes into power you know, next year, 2024. So we'll watch. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a drama, I think, next year. A lot of interesting will happen. Yeah. Thank you, Yanan. Thank you. Thank you so much for this morning. You spent like more than two hours share a lot of like insights. 嘉宾把他们的家底也亮了他们自己投什么看好什么最大的这个顾虑是什么我们今天早上其实讨论了很多的东西包括整个趋势现在的这个流行的这个方向然后在全球各个不同的地方那些投资者他们看好的是哪些